right, so a little bit ago, we had taken a look at this chart where we are looking at several ionic compounds. We are looking at the enthalpies. We are looking at the entropies, and we were trying to figure out some patterns. Okay, so going back to this chart, is there a pattern for the entropy values? If so, what is it? Now, originally, what we were talking about was that, yeah, they're all positive. All the en entropy values are positive. So is there a pattern? Yep. Delta S is positive. Okay. So yeah, that's what we figured out last time. Now, is there a pattern outside of that? And if so, what is it? And here's that part. Okay, here's the new part. We find out that the larger the ion is, the greater the entropy of solution. Now, the larger the ion, remember, that's, I that's atomic radius. I'm sorry, that's ionic radius. So, in that sense, lithium ion would be smallest, followed by sodium ion, followed by potassium ion, and so on. So the larger the ion is, the greater the enthalpy of solution will be. So that's that's kind of the take-home message that we've got. So does the, how does this change in entropy affect the spontaneity of the dissolution process? Well, it becomes more favorable. So the larger the entropy value is, the more favorable this to hold making this the whole dissolution, this whole process of making a solution is going to happen. So just to refresh ourselves, what is entropy again? Entropy is the amount of molecular randomness. Okay. So let's, let's make a little guess here. So what should the sign be for the change in entropy of for dissolution? That sign should be positive. Okay, and so let's, let's verify this a little bit. So again, that equation that tells us whether or not a process is spontaneous, that's the Gibbs free energy equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Okay, and the units for delta G kilojoules per mole, delta H, also kilojoules per mole, delta S, joules per k mole. Okay, now how do the signs of the enthalpy and the entropy terms affect the answer? Well, because you've got entropy is going to have units of joules, enthalpy has units of kilojoules, and then delta G is going to be kilojoules as well, because enthalpy is kilojoules, delta H is going to influence delta G directly. Okay, so usually that means if delta H is going to be negative, usually that means delta G will also be negative, and delta H is positive, Usually delta G is going to be positive. Not all the time, but a pretty good, pretty good guesstimate for right now. Okay, so what can we also predict about the temperature? The temperature dependence on solubility. Well, what we can find is that as the temperature goes up, okay, you've got this other negative T delta S part of the equation. Okay, so as the temperature goes up, what we see is that delta S is going to be greater than zero. That means that delta G should be going down. And if delta S is less than zero, so it's negative, that means that delta G should be going up. So how does temperature play into this? The delta S part is going to be indirect. So it doesn't influence delta G directly. So the delta S part is indirect because you've got the T delta S, the temperature's tied in to the entropy, okay? All right, so we can also take a look at a graph to help us figure out if our prediction works. And so what we're looking at in this picture, in this graph on the, on the y-axis, we've got solubility 
uh, per gram per gram divided by 100 milliliters of water. On the x-axis, we're looking at temperature and we're looking at different compounds here. So it looks like you've got glucose, you've got uh, sodium, sodium acetate, you got sodium nitrate, uh, you've got KBR, copper two sulfate, ammonium chloride, and it looks like all of these graphs tend to get positive. Even sodium chloride here is also increasing just slightly. The only one that seems to be going down is this one right here, cesium-3 sulfate. So that, in general, what we're finding is that as the temperature increases, solubility also increases. Okay, and the reason for that is because the change in entropy should be greater than zero. Now, there, so that's in general, as the temperature increases, solubility increases. Okay, keep in mind that this is solid solute and you got a liquid solvent. Keep that in mind. Okay, now the one that doesn't follow that on this table is cesium sulfate. So what can you conclude about the thermodynamics of that solution? Because it's going in the opposite direction, because this one, this graph, this line is going down, so solubility is decreasing, what we can say is that delta S should be less than zero. So what that means is that it's instead of becoming more disordered, it's actually becoming more ordered. The last topic that we want to talk to talk about before we move on to something else is we want to take a look at solubility again. Again, but what we want to do this time is take a look at how temperature and pressure affect solubility. We saw temperature already a little bit, but temperature also plays a plays another role. So before we do that, let's talk about the difference between a saturated and a super saturated solution. So a saturated solution means that it holds the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved. Okay. A super saturated solution This is an unstable solution. Okay, so keep that in mind. That means it has greater than the equilibrium amount of solute dissolved in the solvent. So it's greater than the equilibrium amount of solute that's dissolved in the solvent. In other words, if, if we look at the saturated solution again, uh, again, it holds the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved at equilibrium. Okay, so this super saturated definition, what this is saying is that it holds more than that saturated amount. So there's definitely a lot more solute in there than there should be. Okay, so let's now, so now that we talked about the difference between a saturated and supersaturated solution, how does temperature play in, play a role in this? So we looked at, in the last, the last section, we looked at what if we had a solid, solid solute and a liquid solvent? What if we have a gas solute with a liquid solvent. How does this affect? How does, how does temperature affect solubility this time around? So we got another graph similar to what we saw previously. So on the y-axis we have solubility, so the units are millimoles per liter. Uh, temperature is on the x-axis, and it looks like this time that as the temperature is increasing, the solubility is decreasing. Okay, so 
if it's a gas, if we study a gas, okay, if we have a gas solute, so let me make that note, as the temperature increases, the solubility decreases. And so that means that the change in entropy for this solution is going to be less than zero. It's going to be negative, which means that it's becoming more ordered. All right, so where this is all playing a role, I mean, this is actually a really big thing. And this is something we can actually study, because if you take, if you let's say you take a can of pop or a can of soda, however you want to say that word, out of the fridge, even if you take bu bubble water or seltzer water, take it out of the fridge, open the can up, okay, and let the can sit out over time. As that can of bubble water gets warmer, it releases carbon dioxide. So less carbon dioxide sits or stays in solution, okay? Now, what this means, if you are a fish or if you're an aquatic plant, what this means is that as the sea temperatures rise, there's going to be less oxygen present. So that means that the sea won't be able to support as much life as it once previously. And so this is a big, big uh, problem with climate change. As our temperatures increase, as the as the as the atmosphere temperatures increase, the sea levels temperatures also have to increase. And as we keep melting more polar ice caps, the temperatures in our oceans and our seas are increasing, which means that these oceans can't hold as much oxygen as it once did. All right, so let, let's get this down. So as the sea temperature rises, less O2 will be present. And that means that the sea will not be able to support as much life as it previously did. And that's, that is a problem. All right, so the solubility of gases in liquids as a function of pressure is so regular that there's actually a scientific law that goes with it, and that is Henry's Law. So Henry's Law talks about the solubility and the pressure function. So Henry's Law says this, the solubility of a gas... in a liquid at a given temperature is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas over the solution. And we actually have an equation that goes along with it that says the solubility, which should be measured in molarity, so I'm going to use a capital M, this is equal to K, a proportionality constant, times the pressure. All right. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this. Let, let's explore this a little bit. All right, so here's a picture of, of Henry's law at work. So let's say you've got you've got a mixture and it's it's it, it's at equilibrium. So at a, at a given pressure, equilibrium exists between the solid between the liquid and the and the vapor states. So uh, the equilibrium exists in which equal numbers of gas particles enter and leave the solution at a time. If I increase the pressure, however, by pushing on the piston a little bit more, more gases 
more gas particles are temporarily forced to stay to go into the solution than are able to leave and eventually we get to our new normal we get to our new equilibrium so this is actually one of the things that we're going to talk about in chapter 15 once we get once we start talking about equilibrium so one an equilibrium means that once you put or uh, there's an idea from equilibrium called the Chatelier's principle which says that if you put a stressor on a chemical situation or a chemical system, that system's gonna alleviate that stress somehow and get back to equilibrium. And so in this case, our stressor is increasing the pressure and eventually the system has to get back to equilibrium. All right, so let's try a problem out. It's been a while since we've done some math. All right, so the solubility of carbon dioxide in water is 3.2 times 10 to the minus second molar at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure. Part A, what is Henry's law constant for carbon dioxide in mole per liter atmosphere? Part B, use the Henry's law constant you calculated in part A to find the concentration of carbon dioxide in a can of soda under a CO2 pressure of 2.5 atmospheres at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, part C, Find the concentration of carbon dioxide in a can of soda open to the atmosphere at 25 degrees Celsius. CO2 is approximately 0.04% by volume in the atmosphere. Holy crap, we got a lot of stuff here. So let's, let's take this one at a time. We're told in this problem that the solubility of carbon dioxide in water is this. 3.2 times 10 to the minus second molar at 25 degrees Celsius and at one atmosphere pressure. So look, you know what the molarity is, you know what the pressure is, okay? So right off the bat, you know those two values, we can actually use that to solve for K. So for part A, we're gonna solve for molarity, the, the solubility is equal to K, the constant, times P, the pressure, okay? We're going to solve for K, so that means I need to divide both sides by P. Okay, so that gives us that the proportionality constant K is going to be equal to the molarity or the solubility divided by the pressure. Now, we know that the molarity is 3.2 times 10 to the minus second. If I, oops, I forgot the time signal. Okay, so that's moles per liter divided by the pressure which is one ATM. Okay, so if I divide 3.2 times 10 to the minus second divided by one, that gives me 3.2 times 10 to the minus second, and it should be moles per liter atmosphere. Okay, so that's part A, that's our constant. Now part B says this, Use the Henry's Law constant we calculated in part A to find the concentration of CO2 in a can of soda if the pressure is 2.5 atmospheres. So we're going to go back to our Henry's Law equation. The solubility is equal to Kp. This time we know what K is because we just solved for it. 3.2 times 10 to the minus second mole per liter atmosphere. We're going to multiply that by the pressure, which is 2.5 ATM. Now look at what happens. ATM in the Henry's Law constant cancels out with the pressure. So the unit's going to be moles per liter, which is molarity by definition. So 3.2 times 10 to the minus second times 2.5 atmospheres should give us 0 0.08 moles per liter. Okay, all right, so we're doing okay. Now here's the tricky part, part C. Find the concentration of CO2, so we're looking for molarity again, in a can of soda that's open to the atmosphere at 25 degrees Celsius. Now CO2 is approximately 0.04% by volume in the atmosphere. Okay, so what? think of it this way. Dalton's law of partial pressure says that the total pressure in the, in the atmosphere 
is going to be equal to the sum of all the partial pressures. So you've got the pressure of, let's say, oxygen plus the pressure of hydrogen plus the pressure of, of carbon dioxide and so on. Okay. And what we're saying is that <clears throat> if you've got, if let's say you've got one atmosphere, carbon dioxide represents 0.04% of that. So if we take one atmosphere times 0.04%, we're going to get a value, the pressure for carbon dioxide will be about 0 0.0004 atm. So that's the amount of pressure that we have for carbon dioxide. So that's how we got around that part. So now we're going to use Henry's Law directly. We're solving for the solubility part. So solubility is equal to Kp. We now know what our pressure is. We know what the K term is. So let's pop that in. 3.2 times 10 to the minus second mole per liter atmosphere. So that was the K that we calculated in part A times the pressure 0 0.0004 atmospheres. So the ATMs cancel out, so we're left with moles per liter. So 3.2 times 10 to the minus second times 0 0.0004. That should give us 1.28 times 10 to the minus fifth molar. And so that was that is the concentration if you leave it of carbon dioxide in pop if you leave it set out. Okay.